Hello, uh, thank you for finding my talk, Factors to Consider When Breeding a Foal. So, I'm sure that most of you already know me, otherwise you probably wouldn't have found this talk, but a little bit of my background is that um, I graduated with my veterinary, veterinary degree from the University of Liverpool in 2016. I then went to New Zealand where I did a one year internship at Matamata Veterinary Services, which is a referral hospital on the North Island of New Zealand. And then after my internship, I stayed there. Um, I stayed on as a full time vet uh, before I returned to Bellevue Veterinary Clinic in Somerset. And then in 2020, I decided that I really wanted to focus on stud medicine as that was becoming clear. That was what my passion was and I did a stud locum position at Newmarket Equine Hospital and then I went to a branch of Scone Equine Hospital in New Zealand, um, in Australia where I worked at the Tamworth Equine Clinic and that was focusing on assisted reproductive techniques such as AI and embryo transfer and then I returned to Bellevue Veterinary Clinic where I've been ever since. So I thought I would start a little bit um, with the background of mare's fertility and explain what it means to be a seasonally polyesterous breeder. So it's basically an evolutionary mechanism to ensure the best conditions for the offspring and that means ensuring that they are born at a time of year when the weather's good, um, the grass is good and they're more likely to be able to survive. So it means that they are only fertile during late spring, early summer and during that time, so the seasonal time, they have multiple Easter cycles. That's what the polyesterous means. And, um, and it's all to do with Mother Nature and day length, really, which leads me on to how does this all work? Well, it's all hormonal control. And what it means is that when we get the increased day length in the spring, we get increased light. So that all affects a hormone called melatonin, which is the hormone of darkness. It's produced at night and it is inhibited by light. Melatonin inhibits gonadotrophin releasing hormone, which is GnRH. And that's the hormone at the top of the reproductive cascade. So um, when we get increased day length, we get reduced melatonin and we get increased cyclicity and uh, that's really fundamental and it's all been designed to protect the mares and the foals. However, humans have interfered and we have arbitrarily chosen the 1st of January for all horses birthdays or um, 1st of August in the Southern Hemisphere. And what that has mean is that's put a pressure on farm managers and breeders to try and breed the earliest foal possible closest to the 1st of January. So that, that foal is bigger, you know, or with its classmates uh, bigger um, for its artificial age, if you see what I mean, because it's going to be called a year older in January, even if it's not a year older, a whole year older. So the solution to this is to kind of trick the body into thinking it is spring when it isn't. And how that works is that you provide um, increased daylight, artificial daylight, either through leaving the stable lights on or using the Equilum mask and it's just a mask with a little light bulb um, in over one eye so it has to be a minimum of 16 hours of daylight from the, around the 1st December and then that is enough to try and start the mare cycling earlier and it does make a really big difference um, if you're leaving the stable lights on, the general rule is you should be able to read the fine print of a newspaper by them so they do have to be fairly bright. Okay, so now to talk about the Easter cycle, which is generally 21 days. However, there's variation between mares and it's divided into two phases. You've got the Easter phase where they're in heat and the diester phase out of heat. Um, Easter usually lasts for six days. Diester normally lasts for 15. Um, but you know, we need to monitor the mare with, you know, the owner looking for the behavioural signs of estrus and the vet checking with either blood tests or ultrasound examinations so that we can be sure because each mare can be a little bit different. Um, and what we're aiming to do is time insemination and cover as close as possible to ovulation.
So when you're watching your mare to see if she's in heat, um, some of the signs that she might display are raising the tail, frequent urination or posturing, winking or a version of the vulva and squealing. Now, um, these are just some general signs. Not all mares will show this. Um, and so you can't rely on it, but you know, just uh, look out for it in case your mare does show these signs. So there are loads of factors to consider if you're going to be a responsible breeder. You need to think about your mare's age. Um, I'll talk about that a bit more later, but fertility does decline with age, particularly in late teenagers. Foaling history, um, if she's had any previous traumatic foalings, um, how her foals did, you know, whether she produced a lot of milk, things like that are really important. Um, health status. It might not be appropriate to breed, or it won't be appropriate to breed if your mare has had serious orthopaedic issues, you know, fractured pelvis, narrowing the birth canal, um, laminitis, because when she's in foal, especially late foal, um, late gestation, she is going to be carrying a huge amount of weight with that foal. And if her feet are not in fantastic condition, then it's, you know, not it's not going to work at all. Well, it's going to be um, a welfare concern. Um, you know, just confirmation of um, her udder, for instance, you know, that picture shows a nodular mass, perhaps a sarcoid quite close to the udder that could potentially cause confusion for the foal when they're nursing. Um, you need to think about desirable traits. Is your mare and is the offspring from this mare and stallion going to be adding to the equine population in a positive way? And you need to have a plan for the foal's future. Is this foal going to be um, a homebred that you are going to compete and have and look after for the rest of its life? Or are you aiming to have this as a sales prospect? Either way, there is a large financial commitment that you cannot always predict because there might be complications, um, you know, or there might be hidden costs to do with the stud fee, the collection of semen, the shipping. So it's something you really need to research before making this commitment. And the other one we've already discussed, the time of year. So it is not going to be possible to get her in foal in the winter. You need to think about everything on this list and probably more. So once you've decided that you would like to have a foal, you need to think about what method is going to suit your mare and what method the stallion you've chosen um, is available for. So if you have a thoroughbred and you're wanting to breed a thoroughbred, you're going to have to use natural cover. If you are um, dealing with another breed, you've got a whole um, host of options available to you. So artificial insemination, and that will include fresh, chilled and frozen semen, um, embryo transfer, um, ovum pickup, and intracytoplasmic sperm injection. If you're thinking of embryo transfer, you obviously also need to have a recipient mare, and that can be um, quite tricky. You know, you have to time the, they have to be in sync really um, with their Easter cycles. And then cloning. I don't know if anyone else recently saw that article, how they've managed to produce a filly foal from a male um, horse's skin, which is kind of mind-blowing. Um, but anyway, back to the topic. Um, the Bellevue is a beaver-approved um, artificial insemination practice, and both myself and David have extensive experience with this, and I also have some experience with embryo transfer. So, just to give you an overview of how the timelines might work, we would start with a pre-breeding soundness examination, evaluating, evaluating the mare's confirmation and palpating her uterus and ovaries and using an ultrasound to image those. We would advise pre-breeding disease surveillance. Um, that will be an, a requirement if your mare is going to go to stud. But if you're having the semen delivered to you, you know, it's optional, but it's strongly encouraged. It's in your best interest to do this surveillance because any of these diseases that your mare might potentially have could result in infertility or abortion. So it's very important that you check before you start to see whether they're there. Then you will be looking at when you're doing your insemination or cover. And then 
14 days after that you'll be looking to hopefully find a pregnancy and you will need to have another check two days later to screen for twins um, or it might be you know it might be a variable time later but you need to have another check because mares are not designed to carry twins and it can be very dangerous for both the mare and the foals if if they do carry twins um, around after day 21 I like to do them around day 24 to check for heartbeat and then a final check around day 35. This is significant because if your mare was to resolve the pregnancy or lose the pregnancy before day 35, there's a chance that she would cycle again and be able to be put in foal that same season. However, after day 35, endometrial cups have formed and the mare won't be able to cycle again that season. And then around day 65, you can have an additional scan to determine whether your mare is carrying a colt or a filly. So pre-breeding disease surveillance, as I've mentioned, this is an absolute requirement when your mare is going to see a stallion, um, or, but it is also extremely heavily encouraged if you're using AI because it's in everyone's interest to survey for these diseases because they are prevalent in the equine population and they can cause a whole host of problems. So there will be a blood sample to screen for equine viral arteritis, EVA, and equine infectious anemia, which is EIA, and a clitoral swab to um, culture any bacteria involved with contagious equine sorry, I just, <laughs> equine metritis, and an endometrial swab, which will also screen for contagious equine metritis, but it will also grow any other bacteria that might be there and you need to know about because that could be a reason why your mare is, would, would fail to conceive. So I just put these up for interest of what you might see at different stages, a sort of timeline. Um, beginning on the top left is a twin pregnancy at day 14 uh, so one of those will need to be reduced and then next to it is the single pregnancy on day 14 and then as we go across the top you can the um, embryo is developing and this is when the heartbeat is a little flicker and visible and then on the bottom row the, the rapidly expand, expanding um, fluid and developing Bowl, and then you can really see the skeleton at about day 55 which is quite amazing wanted to just put this slide in um, please do not underestimate brood mares sometimes people think they're just old um, you know they're not competition horses they're just living out in a field but actually you know <laughs> they can be quite feral in those few months when they're carrying the foal and not having a lot of handling and uh, the picture on the left is one broodmare that kicked another quite badly, which is not uncommon. So um, you need to be careful when they're all out in a herd together. And that's, the other picture is me scanning in Australia. And it's really important to have good examination facilities. Um, if I have any doubt, I will also sedate the mare because it's really not worth the risk to injury to people or horses if you're not using the appropriate facilities and safety um, mechanisms. So just going to talk about age a bit more. So you can breed from two years old. Peak fertility is around six to seven years old and it rapidly declines from 15 years old. The pictures is, are from a mare that came in for a pregnancy diagnosis but actually had a uterus full of pus, basically a pyometra. Um, these lavages, which we often do, um, should come out clear so you can read through them. But as you can see, this is opaque and thick with pus. So older maidens struggle because the uterus is more fibrous and the cervix can be fibrous as well and, and fail to dilate. So it's quite common to have an inflammatory reaction after cover. But in a younger mare, the... Um, the inf inflammatory material can be resorbed through the lymphatics or um, ejected out of the cervix, whereas an older mare it can just sort of sit there and fester at body temperature and uh, create a perfect bacterial soup. So um, age is important. I want to talk to you a little bit about some terminology. A caslix vulvoplasty. 
um, it's been around for a very long time and it's basically a little surgery we can do to help prevent bacteria entering the uterus. So um, the vulva is part of the three seals, the vulva, the vestibular vaginal seal and the cervix. And all these barriers need to be functioning well to maintain a sterile environment within the uterus. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, age, poor perineal conformation, weight loss or injuries can cause these barriers to fail. So if the vulva barrier is failing, what we do is we um, we do a surgical incision and then stitch the vulval lips together um, leaving an opening at the bottom so maybe two-thirds stitched together so that um, it prevents poo getting into the vulva um, or other bacteria so um, if your mare has one of these they then must be opened um, prior to folding otherwise it's going to tear quite quite badly so I know this has been quite a, a wide-ranging diverse talk but some points that I really wanted to emphasise were try and develop a good relationship with the stallion owner. Communication really is key. There's so many moving parts involved with getting a mare in full and often, you know, the, the plan is fluid. So you need to make sure everyone understands and we're all working towards the same goal. But communication is really important. Um, read the contract. Is it no foal, no fee? If you're using frozen, how many straws are you getting? Are you paying per straw or are you paying per foal? Um, how, you know, what's the stallion's fertility like? Um, has the, the semen been stored properly? Um, is it shipped properly? Because, um, you know, if it's not shipped properly, it can be damaged and be basically no good once it arrives. So um, you need to have open dialogue about that. And you need to look into the costs for collection and shipping because they can rapidly mount up. Um, and then really success is down to individual factors all aligning. And that's the mare fertility, the stallion fertility and timing ultimately to get the, the miracle of life. So um, a lot of work goes into getting a mare in full and you can't take it for granted that it's always going to happen because there's lots of moving parts and it makes it more special when it does all come together and work well, but it's just worth remembering that nothing, don't take anything for granted. Um, it's a great journey to be on, but there's a lot involved. Thank you so much for listening. I hope it's been useful. And um, if you've enjoyed it, please, could you make a very, um, a, a donation to the Wiltshire Air Ambulance? That would be um, very much appreciated. Thank you so much. Cut.